no menu da manhã das nossas conferências, temos vindo da Alemanha o excelente desenhador tipos de letra e de marcas Hubert Johan e do Porto o Eduardo Aires do White Studio como uma referência do excelente design que se faz a Norte de Portugal. Enquanto que à tarde servimos um workshop fresquinho pelo nosso convidado alemão e uma masterclass seguida de um workshop com os, com os especiais convidados ao estúdio, ambos focados na experimentação da caligrafia e da tipografia. Não se esqueçam de passar pelo nosso tempo de barbucha uh, para provar os nossos menus de iguarias, viçarias e simpatias. Pela nossa feira Stica, com obras de diversos autores, como o Vazar Popular, Noturma, Oficina de Cego, Inclusão, entre outros. E saborei os trabalhos criativos das nossas gentes de gráfica e multimédia pelas quatro exposições patentes. O primeiro convidado de hoje é Hubert Yoka. Uh, Hubert Yoka, nascido em 1965, é um premiado designer de tipos com base em Lauca, Alemanha. Iniciou aos 16 anos a sua experiência com a tipografia enquanto aprendiz de composição com tipos de chumbo. Mais tarde, depois de ter estado em Augsburg, rumou ao norte da Inglaterra, onde desenvolveu estudos sobre o Itália Renascentista. Realizou trabalhos para Henry, Henry and Ludlow and Schmidt em Londres e para as revistas Frank, Arena e Harvey Nicholson's e Speed. Trabalho por conta própria desde 1999, desenhando todo o tipo de fontes e tipografia aplicada em símbolos, pictogramas, marcas para empresas e produtos. Desenvolve a sua atividade no âmbito do design gráfico. Pratica consultoria em tipografia e direção criativa para revistas internacionais. Uma salva de palmas, por favor. Ok. Can you hear me? The only thing I understood was the word Augsburg. <laughs> Is anybody here from Augsburg? Um, who studies in Augsburg normally? Because I heard there is an exchange. Okay, I'm very honored to be here. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, sometimes I really don't know how people know me. But <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I will talk about the life as a type designer. This is a type designer, and he's a very special species. Um, in his head, he has a brain like every human being, but on one side, it's black, and on the other side, it's white. We can zoom in. There is no point of going any further, because it's a clear vector-based Thing. Oh. Okay. But you normally can't see it. Most of you know Jan Cichold, I would say. He's one of the most important type designers of the 20th century. And in one of his books, he made comments about logotypes. Here it says, uh, specimens of a horror chamber of contemporary lettering, logotypes that failed. So, wrong. Or this one, examples of poor sans serif capitals. So it's wrong. <laughs> and this one, examples of poor sans serif letters. As you might have seen my work, I'm designing logo types. And I have to admit, um, the examples I've shown here, I do like. Sorry, Mr. Chickhold. I think they have character. And um, they have exactly that what you need when you do a logo type. Being a type designer, even a famous one, doesn't mean you know everything. Um, And we will talk about type designers later, what they tend to do, really. Because I, what I do, and Alexis does at the same time, we, we are doing logo types and typefaces. And that is a big advantage. So maybe you know the saying of Martin Luther. He said once, um, and I'm changing it a little bit. Um, out of a pinched arse, there comes no joyful 
a, I would say. It's normally it's a fart, but. <laughs> Still, Jan Chichold is one of the most important type designers of the 20th century. I don't want to take something from him, but I just want to say he was a bit, a bit stiff um, in his, uh, how he uh, valued stuff. Talking about mistakes, um, this is a certificate of my fourth grade, and this is about handwriting, and I was really bad at it. <laughs> This was one of my first type designs I did when I did my exchange in England. And you can see, and I, I think it's very ugly, um, but you have to see that when you do type design, you have to really understand the system, a complex system, and you have to know that the first thing you do can't be right. So you have to make a lot of mistakes to be good at it. This was just after my, I finished my studies. Um, it was the first digitalized font I did. I will talk about the way it's designed later on because it's uh, very much in the, in the way the Augsburg School uh, designs typefaces because there is a certain tradition. But I would never do something like that nowadays. In this typeface, I wanted to merge um, upright and italic forms. Um, but at the end, it doesn't really work because it feels like its feet are bound together. This is a typeface I did in 1995, and there I tried to bring um, different stroke, uh, strokes together, like digital strokes and broad pen strokes. But it all falls a bit apart. It's, it's just trying to find a way into what can you do with a typeface. Um, I talk a bit about rules in type as well, and this is uh, one rule that I think is quite interesting on, in one way. It's from Joost Tohuli, and he said, the U has to be a bit smaller than the N um, because light falls in from top. Um, it sounds very interesting. But the more you think about that rule, the more you believe it. Um, and you have, to really, uh, you have to really decide if you want to go with that rule. You can do it, it, there is no fault. But if you don't do it, it's not a fault as well. So um, in design, it's always. Um, we can talk about rules, we can talk about the way you do things and the way it's working, but there are no certain rules. I was trained as a typesetter. I did all those lead setting things for three years. Um, I was one of the last in, um, in the whole area, and all the others worked uh, with Berthold and Linotype uh, systems those big machines that were very noisy. And um, I felt like a dinosaur at that time, and uh, I couldn't work in that area anymore. But after all, it was a blessing for me to, to have learned all that lead setting stuff. Um, when you do lead setting, you have to learn to read, type, turned around, um, and swapped in this gray, uh, contrastless um, um, environment. But after a while, you can, you can read as fast as normal. So talking about legibility, because type designers always love to talk about legibility, it's, it's much more complex uh, than you think. And I often 
hear type designers say this is legible and this is not legible, and I would always say, wait a minute, you can't really say that. It's not um, scientific, it's just your opinion. Um, it's more about what people are ready to learn, and that's legible. So it can, be, it can be also something complicated or difficult to read. If people are ready to read it and love to read it, it's legible. I also did um, actual final artwork in that time when I worked in this printing shop because they were changing to offset printing. And I tried to sketch, um, I tried to sketch typefaces but nobody showed me that time. I started to, to dive into typefaces, but um, nobody showed how to sketch it, how to really feel the stroke, um, and only later I learned how to do it. And that's what we learned this afternoon in the workshop as well. I studied in Augsburg, um, and as I said there, are people, sometimes there are people here from Augsburg as an exchange, and um, I really like to, to, uh, to be in that school because it has a very strong decision, what nobody really knows. Um, there is a strong connection to arts and crafts, and Edward Johnston, who did the London Underground typeface, he was a teacher of um, Italic Renaissance handwriting, or handwriting, and he had a, um, a student called Anna Simons, and she, he, told, he said she was one of his best students ever. And she uh, translated his books into German and also took his teaching to Germany. Um, more or less in a, in a straight tradition, all those people uh, um, I mean, not all those people, but uh, Eugen Nerdinger, he taught in Augsburg, and Lisa Beck, and till now, Hans Heidmann, he's uh, the professor, professor in typography in Augsburg. He's leaving, I think, this year or next year, he's, he's retiring. And um, therefore, because it was based on arts and craft, it, Augsburg has quite a crafts, uh, crafts tradition uh, in doing typefaces. And what Hans Heidmann taught us was one thing that um, um, I only heard in Augsburg, that the main stroke should have a bracketed outline. You can see here, it's got a, a slight curve to the inside. Um, the reason for that is uh, that he said, the white is always lighter than the black, and it shines over the black. So at the corners, the white shines over the black, so the corners fall in. That's why you have to have a curve. Um, you have to be careful about that. He also said that this might be the reason for the serifs. Um, I, don't want to say much about it because the serif are so complex and um, you can't really tell that there is a, a reason for the serifs um, that come from a tool. It's more or less a, an optical decision, I would say. It's my, um, my opinion is that it's an, an optical decision the Romans made to the form. I also did an exchange here, an Erasmus exchange here in um, Lancashire, in North England, in Preston. And that's where I did the first sketches for this typeface. And I found this book um, in a bookstore. It was very cheap. And this is about uh, Italic handwriting teachers. And I was really um, encouraged by the way those teachers taught different ways of handwriting, even in the Renaissance, even in the, in the 14th century. And that was the reason for my decision uh, for my diploma. I, um, yeah, I, uh, um, 
I made an exhibition about uh, the history of uh, italic printing typefaces of the Renaissance. So the italic, I didn't want to do a typeface during that time because I thought I can do that anyway. I wanted to do something that has content and I learned so much about italic typefaces and with italic you have to really talk about Roman too. So that is a very good basis for me to, to do my typeface work nowadays. I had two main teachers in that time and the one was Hans Heidmann, who's the type teacher, and the other one is a typography teacher. But he was much better in, um, in uh, teaching me how to deal with content, how to deal with history. So I thought I want to do that and, I, and he was my tutor in that time. And the other one, Hans, he um, was the second tutor. But um, he didn't like that because he wanted me to do a typeface and after that he, he was um, kind of, he didn't like me anymore for some reason because I didn't do that. So um, I was very sad about that and um, that m made me, at the end, that made me go away from the whole teaching of Augsburg like a rebellious decision I had. That's why I did all those typefaces I showed you earlier because I was, I was angry um, because he's a, he was supposed to be a teacher and he shouldn't do stuff like that. <laughs> this is the first printing type from Aldus Manutius or Francesco Griffo. Um, and it's very rough. It was invented um, about 1500 and they printed very small books with it because it was space saving in a way. And it was not like now um, just that illumination in text, it was a text typeface. So that was the reason I said, well, we have to, I have to really uh, think about what, what the italic typeface does. In the Roman, I, that was part of the diploma, I, I, I um, really uh, went into, into the two um, way uh, the typefaces are nowadays, the upright and the italic, and I had to, to see what, what, the, what the optical um, and formal uh, um, system, systems are. And in the upright, the uh, architecture plays a big role because everything is on the baseline. You have the, the serifs on two sides on the baseline on, on many characters. So the baseline plays a very important role. In the italic or cursive, uh, it comes from curere and it means uh, walk or run fast. It's different. You don't have a feeling of a strong baseline anymore. It's more dynamic and it, 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 it tends to, to go up to the right. Um, the uppercase letters play always a difficult role in italics um, because they have their serifs on both sides. It, they always look a bit alien in, in the typeface and you can ask any type designer how difficult it is to have, um, have uh, uppercase letters in a in an italic typeface. Only a few years ago I thought back to my studies um, and I did two typefaces that deal with the italic uh, in an interesting way. This is called Ramon and it's quite a, a lively sun serif um, but it has an italic that is very strong. It has a slap serif italic more or less because I wanted to, 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 to give that sun serif a strong italic that uh, with the same gray shade it should have a stronger enlightenment. So this was Ramon and also Gary Sons. I made those two typefaces at the same time, really. 
This is also a sun serif with a humanistic touch, but still quite modern. And it also has a, a very strong italic. Um, if you look at, um, at Renaissance italics, they even have different angles in the strokes, and I try to bring that into a sun serif as well. I designed a book for a friend. A friend uh, wrote a book. Uh, it's a philosophical book, and I um, used uh, Gary Sons in that book. In 1997, I went to London because the art director of Frank magazine, um, Boris Bencic, he was the art director of Arena magazine after uh, Neville Brody. And they did this new magazine called Frank. And I was working there first as a typographer in, for the basic layout. And then uh, I slowly did some typefaces for that magazine. So um, yeah, this, this headline phase I did for them um, with, with big contrast and also Libris. One of my first typefaces I call with a name <laughs> because it's, the quality is uh, that good that I still would call it with a name. Um, and they used it in Frank magazine. And later, um, Boris went to Switzerland and did a, a redesign of the Bali brand. And we worked together on that and they also used um, Libris as a corporate typeface after that. And we did all the basic, um, the basic elements and won a prize for the basic elements then. Um, I worked on that too, so I'm not only doing typefaces, I'm doing graphic design work too. Um, and that was, I, I spent a month there and um, later in the next year I went to London to work for a branding company called Henrian, Ludlow and Schmidt, and they did big German brands based in London because the bosses were German. And on one hand, I worked in branding. On the, on the other hand, in the evening, I worked for, for the magazines to do, for example, just one type, uh, for one, one letter for one, um, for, for one issue. So on one hand, there was uh, Corporate branding that was made for many years, and then um, publishing that was made for one issue, maybe only. And, and that gave me an interesting um, variation of work, really. For Arena Magazine, I did this very light stencil typeface. And that's why I love to work for magazines. It's so, you can try many things, you can go to extremes. And with this typeface, you can just write over, um, over a picture and don't disturb the picture that much. Because London is a melting pot and there are so many people who are there and go somewhere else. I started to, because a friend of mine, he went to New York and he worked on ESPN magazine actually and he asked me to, do, to work on a typeface there. And then I got in contact with Edward Leder, who's still a friend of mine, we still work together. And he uh, was the founder, or uh, the graphic founder of Details Magazine and W Magazine. And since that time I work for them, or they use my typefaces like uh, Details. Um, and W at the moment is using a, a serif typeface I did. Um, so, it slowly spread in the business that I do typefaces for publishing. After that time in London, I went back to Germany. And since that time, I have my own foundry and work as a type designer and brand designer in the countryside of Bavaria. <laughs> In Germany, um, we have something called federalism. We have many little states. We have just 
except Berlin, we have a few bigger cities. And uh, through this federalism, we have a, a, a separate school system. So we have different schools and different design schools that have a different basis, like Augsburg, for example. So Germany is quite, uh, has a lot of type designers, really. If you look at the TDC um, hand-ins, um, the most uh, people hand-in come from America, and then Germany, and then nothing, really, till you come to, to Net the Netherlands. So Germany is quite a big, quite a big uh, type country because we have that variation of teaching. Um, so they're everywhere, but, but it's not communicated. It's, diff it's more difficult to communicate different kind of teaching. Like in the Netherlands, you have more or less one important school, and you can m more or less immediately see uh, what typeface come from that school. But we don't have that. It's so different. But the impression from outside is that all the German type designers live in Berlin. The reason for that is surely because it's because of the typo conference that was last week. And I wasn't there. <laughs> um, that I, I, I say that because I, um, I just want to work against that impression because there is much more to German type design than Berlin. And the problem with a typo in Berlin is that it was um, Fontshop, and Fontshop was bought by Monotype. And my problem with the whole um, what happens in the business is that Monotype is now one of the biggest owner of all the historic foundries. And they uh, tend to really sit on the whole market and tend to really change everything that happens there. The advantage is that they don't have a real cultural, um, they don't work in culture anymore. They just want to sell. And so there are so many type designers and young type designers that do very good work and can sell their typefaces because the technology is so good, you can produce it on your own. Ah, oh, one thing I did for Berlin. This is one of the famous beers in Berlin, and there is this, I, I, I had to work on the, on the logo type, but I always saw this bear and I thought, well, he's got his ass at the front. <laughs> and they wanted to have it more masculine. So I had a look at the bear and I thought, well, you can do just a little trick to make it more male. And <laughs> I actually sent it to them. <laughs> Not the customer, but the, but the agency. But I think they didn't see it. <laughs> anyway, it's always better to have a variety of teaching. Um, and for me, I can say I don't feel like I, I belong to any way of type design. I do my own stuff because I had to find my own way. And that's always, for type design, that's a very good thing. For design, it's a very good thing. Um, because you have to create character, and character is something that um, is only strong if you're alone, in a way. In 2004, I did a typeface for Boris again, and uh, that is the one in, in the corner, and that one is based on um, those Spencerian illustrations done in the 70s. And it's not written, it's, it's really drawn. It was part of a magazine that was called Upper and Lower Case from ITC, Type Foundry, uh, International Type Foundry. 
and um, that was published in the 70s and 80s. And they had those illustrations very big. It was a quite a big format. And um, we got that in a printing shop uh, where I worked. And I always loved those typefaces. And I wanted to do a real typeface, or the, wanted to create a real typeface out of that. Those illustrations were made by Tony Despinia. He was partner of Herb Lubelin and made all these illustrations. And is based on, on a teaching that is clearly American. Um, a guy called Platt, Roger Spencer, was teaching that handwriting. And his whole family was teaching in all America. And uh, it, was, it was written with a, with a sharp pen that was soft, and you could, if you press more, you could do the, the thick parts. And he was teaching that um, quite for a long time. But what I did is a real typeface you can, you can set in, in the computer. And um, I'm, nowadays, you can find quite some typefaces that work like that. Uh, but I was at least one of the first who tried to do that. Edward Leader from W Magazine, he asked me to, um, to do ornaments to the typeface. And that was the first thing I did, um, which was quite nice. But you can see it was the first. And I did something else for him, which I don't really like because it gets too extreme. And it's, got, it's a kind of repetition in the form, so it was a bit too much. But later, I had to work for Tiffany in New York, and I had to just do ornaments. And I really like that, because it, it's got this quality uh, they had in the 70s, um, that there is no repetition, and you had to find um, a good shape, like a cloud. Um, I had to do a round shape, a long, and um, an upright, and a, and a horizontal. Um, and it's actually not very complicated to make that. You start with a pen and uh, with, a, with a pencil, and um, you slowly get into um, organizing those forms. It's not as complicated as you might think. You just have to start to do it. And I think most of you could do something like that. So that's the other one. And they used it in the background of their, of their brochures and the horizontal one. Now this is Nartis. It's one of my typefaces that still sell quite well. And the idea was to, to have a neoclassic typeface that has this thin line. It was based on, on Mommy, uh, but as an upright form. And I wanted to have those forms go uh, start from the letter itself and go into the next or the, the formal letter and uh, only have one, no, no alternative, just one letter. So um, I did three versions, one with one very ornamental version, then a, a, a drops version and a normal version. Um, there is a text version as well. And what I did uh, two years ago was a uh, grotesque for it. So it's not just a sun serif of a serif typeface. Um, I try to really create a classic uh, 19th century um, grotesque, but more or less based on the forms of uh, Nartes. But if you, if you go back and have a look at the, at the classic specimens, you can, you can see that, uh, um, I mean, in the 19th century, there are a lot of typefaces just called grotesque. They have no name. And I try to go back to, to the basis of, a, of sans serif typefaces. So I created Nartes Grotesque. And um, as you can see, 
Uh, most of the time, if I do serif or sun serif typefaces, I make my families quite big, so from a light version to an ultra bold version. And um, years before, I did that very straight, so from the light to the bold, there, there, um, the, the weights developed quite linear. But now I start, the last years, I started to change that. Um, I try to do the weights um, how they uh, because of the usage. So the first, so this is light, book, regular, and medium you can use in text as a as a, a basic text typeface. And then you have two words, two weights, semi bold and bold, and those are the text um, enlightened weights and. In the semi-bold, the white is a bit stronger, and in the bold, the, bo the, the black gets a bit stronger than the white. So that's the step where you come from white to black. Um, and the rest is headline weights. So this is text. One thing I, because I have so many customers in Hamburg, um, so many agencies I work for in branding, and I don't know how they, or why they asked me, but Hamburg, the, the city of Hamburg asked me to do a typeface for them. And it will be, it will be launched, I, I think it's, it, you can see it already. It's a sun serif typeface. also with all, all the weights I showed you. The interesting thing is I, I want to tell, I'm, I'm living just in a small village on the country, and um, I, I just feel a bit proud that Hamburg comes to me that <laughs> and asks me for a typeface. Um, and it's not a disadvantage to live somewhere on the country, um, it's even better than being or living really there because uh, I go to Hamburg every year and I do visit all the people I know there and it's more or less an event. I meet everybody and um, it's always a nice time with them and the impression is it's much stronger than to be there all the time. So you need to keep the contact. Um, but it's no disadvantage to live on the country. Shoko is one of the uh, typefaces I did for packaging. And it's a, a brush script typeface. And uh, quite some years ago, I did this version. It's just one weight. Um, and it sweat quite a bit in the packaging world. And I just, yeah, it's used for something like that. Um, but it's also used like that, so they made it bolder. And it looks so chunky and bad. So I decided to do a bold version of Shoko. But also with... Um, swirls to it. And because packaging is also is, is very uh, space, um, you have to be space confident. <laughs> um, you have to be space confident because you don't have a lot of space to use it. So the fat version has got a much, much bigger X height um, to work well uh, in spacing. So these are all the swirls. And ligatures. And it's just made for something like that. And now I show you, <laughs> I show you a little movie we did. And um, anything that can go wrong went wrong with that. Um, we we, we tr tried to let it melt. And just look at that. 
and the wind blow in and, and took everything away and we had to do it 10 times and um, then it got too hot and something. <laughs> it gets worse. Um, It's stinked. <laughs> what I want, want to say, uh, and what I tell students all the time, is don't let type designers tell you what to do. Um, try to find your own way. I made so many mistakes, and um, I mean, you have to settle into making mistakes. And um, I mean, the big mistakes, um, you always have to get up afterwards and do something new. Uh, I think a few years ago, I was a bit depressive because I thought I've done so many things. Um, there is nothing to add to it. I can't do another typeface anymore. And I got more and more grumpy, and um, I was not satisfied till I realized that I have to go on doing it. Um, it's not that I have to do it. I have to do it because otherwise um, I, I'm not satisfied. So I have to work. And the interesting thing is that something like Ramon and Gary Sons happened after, after that time. So there is always something new you can do in a typeface. So um, it will always go on, although you might not imagine it, but it goes on and, and, and something new happens. Now I'll show you some brand marks I did. It's just big German brand marks I worked on, and, and, and I want to, sh want to show you, in this one, I want to show you the process. This is, um, I don't know what you call it, um, food in tins, conserve something, yeah. Um, it's a big German brand, and I had to work on that uh, logo type. And first, I start to, to really analyze what's wrong in the typography, or what, what might be a problem um, visually. And that are the first steps I do to the, to the word mark. And in the first steps, because they are so small, I always do an outline over the old, over the old version because people might not see it. Um, but the, the, you get far away and change more and more things. So it even gets calligraphic. This is the way I sketch when I do it by hand. Um, and this was the version they chose afterwards. So it's more, very often the customer wants to see something very near to the existing in the, and, and you do some development, um, there is a positioning they want to go after, um, and you try to make examples in, the, in this positioning. So the, the customer has something to choose. How far does he want to go with a, with a brand? This is also a sketch for a yogurt shop in Hamburg. And you can see that it's very near to the drawing. Um, but you have to draw sometimes to really gain a form that you wouldn't gain with digital. Uh, in, in a digital way. Well, you can draw on a tablet, this would do the job. Um, but I always try to find the good mixture between digital and, um, and handwork. This is also a logo I did for a friend. Um, and I like to really sketch quite rough. To, um, it's more or less to, to build the shape itself because the little elements you can always change later. So this is the final artwork.
This was a German retailer that um, is quite traditional. There is, uh, they they um, were there for years, but then they went bankrupt and um, they were bought from somebody else and we had to do the logotype. And I, I was able to do that, but after two years, they went bankrupt again and the people who worked there, they drowned it in Berlin. <laughs> they drowned it. Um, because the management was so bad, and this was more or less a demonstration of um, that it was everything was wrong. But they took it out again, and now it's in the in the uh, Latin Museum in Berlin. <laughs> this is quite a. Do you have it here? No. Do you have it? Yeah. Um, um, years ago, they had this smile in the in the word mark, and I always didn't like it because I, I liked the, the basic word mark of it, so I had to do a version um, that was a bit uh, um, cleaner and more flat, and um, so I took that smile out and made it more legible. And I even did the next version of it, so this is the actual version, and now it's flat, it's got this, this um, um, A pen, so okay. this brush script endings. This is an example of an, an, a redesign that I do quite often. So there is an existing logo type that needs to be more modern, and um, you just can't change the whole typeface. You just have to make it to take the, the unimportant stuff away and keep the brand itself. So that's how it looks. Now I want to show you something else. That's German, sorry about that. <laughs> you didn't translate that. Um, a few years ago on Facebook I showed this typeface and um, Stefan Hattenbach, a Swedish type designer, he said about those letters, uh, he called them Hubert Brave Curves, he said. And um, because I work in outlines all the time, I'm missing tools in the type design programs and in Illustrator. I hate Illustrator because it's so limited down. And I decided to... Um, work on a concept of a new application to work with outlines. And um, I did the whole system and the whole... Uh, I have some ideas that could be really, really helpful. And we want to do... A friend of mine, he's a, he's a, a coder and a programmer, and he, he will program that. He's a bit of a... He has a problem with it because it's very complex. Um, but we want to do an iPad app for drawing outlines and typefaces. Um, we're in the middle of it. You will know it if, if it's there, but <laughs> we take our time because it's only the two of us who work on it. Maybe we have to get other people to work on it, but um, uh, I would love to have something like that for a workshop we do in the afternoon because um, it's so important to really learn how to deal with outlines. And um, yeah, maybe we have the time to, to, that I can show you a bit this afternoon. So, what does it take to be a good type designer? Because there is another thing that I learned through my experience. Um, you have to talk to the users. I didn't translate that, that's Anwender in Germany. Um, you have to talk to the users to know what typeface um, is needed and uh, you have to have a feeling for what, what you need because I worked in branding and publishing and packaging so I uh, know what the people need so I can do the right typefaces for them. And it's good to have friends there and maybe have a beer or two. Um, and then 
in the brain of the type designer slowly happen, happen stuff like gray cells that appear in the brain and maybe some humor. <laughs> Thank you. Passamos agora a uma breve conversa. Querem colocar algumas questões? Hello. Hello. So, uh, I have a simple question. How do you know how, what name to give your typefaces? Like, how do you name your typefaces? Oh, difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. There are so many typefaces on the market now. You have an idea of a, of a name and you, you search for it and it's there already. It's, it's, sometimes it's even more difficult to find a name than to design a typeface. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, obrigado, Hubert. Thank you, Hubert. Uma salva de palmas, por favor. Obrigado. Vamos prosseguir então daqui a 15 minutos com a próxima apresentação do White Studio após um breve intervalo. Obrigado, até já. Thank you.